In Anglo-Norman Ulster, the history and archaeology of an English barony, T. E. McNeill states, the basis of the wealth of the Norman earldom of Ulster, as opposed to the Irish kingdoms, lay in its more profitable practice of agriculture. Most accounts of manorial receipts include figures derived from the profits of mills. We also learn from McNeill that the 12th century Norman military occupation of Ulster is fuelled by flour from mills. As a food source for the knights, soldiers, bowmen, chaplains and civil staff. He states, the amount of flour sent there to Carrickfergus Castle was four times that of Dundrum, nearly ten times that sent to any other castle. On these maps, we can see how the established modern town come city of Bangor, which began with settler Lord James Hamilton's early 1600s successful trading settlement, had expanded steadily until an 1865 railway line opening created the conditions for an affluent housing surge spreading along the attractive shore to the east, which eventually encompassed rural Ballyhome in the 19th and 20th centuries. But is there much more to this place name than the mixed pastels of elegant, profuse, yet often personal Victorian and Edwardian seaside architecture? Modern Ballyhome began its identity as a townland, the small official geographical division of land across the island of Ireland. It was incorporated into a group of 30 townlands under the collective name of Bangor Parish, a typical civil and ecclesiastical administrative territory. You can see here that Ballyhome prior to 1850 is just a small collection of buildings where Fruit Hill Park now lies, centred around a water mill which worked both corn and wheat at various stages of its existence. In 1837 in his Notes on Natural Features for the Ordnance Survey, Army Officer Lieutenant Henry Tucker states in Ballyhome there is a flour mill with a breast wheel 19 feet in diameter and 5 feet in breadth. In the same townland there is a windmill for grinding corn. Tucker notes the water mill feeder pond area occupied some three acres in total. The site of that pond lies between the current Broomhill Park and Riverside Road where the small lively Ballyhome River can still be seen crossing under the bridged road nearby. The rural hilltop windmill to the west was constructed around 1780. The water mill would have preceded it and possibly constructed in one form or another centuries earlier. To quote William McCutcheon in the Industrial Archaeology of Northern Ireland, windmill and water mill often occurred in close proximity on one and the same farm with the windmill perched on top of the wheelback and the water mill standing on the stream winding between the drumlins. The term bally comes from the Anglo-Norman word bale or bailey, meaning an occupied site or settlement. It is prolific in North Down townland names, as prolific as the Normans were in seizing East Coast Irish lands and maximising their output. 19 of the 30 townlands in Bangor Parish were prefixed with bale and a close relationship of that spelling is illustrated in English cartographer Thomas Raven's 1625 tenancy map, commissioned by a very competitive James Hamilton, first Viscount Clanavoy, the successful owner of a private North Down plantation.
consisting of former Gaelic lordship lands in County Down, with prosperous new Bangor town at its centre, awarded by the Scottish King James I of England, for whom Hamilton had formerly worked as an agent in Ireland. You can find this beautiful Raven map book itself and a superb interactive exhibit at North Down Museum in Bangor. At its most basic understanding, the Normans adopted the existing medieval Gaelic Irish farming land block system and took over its management more efficiently for profit. These blocks eventually became identified in modern history as the townlands we know. They were grouped according to ownership, whether an earldom, a barony, a manor or a ville, in that order of scale, and at times could be no more than a mott earthen fort responsible for a total area of a few hundred acres. The basic Norman unit of land management was the caricate, which was the total amount of land one tenant farmer could manage, or about 100 acres. For example, in 1333 Ulster Norman records, there is a ville mott residence called Villa Wavarum, responsible for five and a half caricates, or approximately 600 acres, which as a territorial entity over time became a townland first known as Bailey Oran and now Bally Oran. It was 1.5 miles from the much larger medieval Dundonald Manorial Estate, now an East Belfast suburb. From their generational history of intensive estate and trade management, first in Normandy and later Great Britain after 1066 AD, the invading Normans in Ulster post 1177 AD were particularly adept in the management of crop production for domestic consumption and profitable trade. Their original, well-founded or adoptive medieval grain milling sites in some cases saw continued use through the centuries into the 1800s, long after the demise of their estates. A good mill site, as we see later, is always a good mill site. There were over 6,000 mills recorded in the Doomsday Book of 1086 AD. In an example of local medieval commercial grain activity, the abbot of nearby Grey Abbey Monastic site, just nine miles from Ballyhome, was granted a grain export license in 1223 AD by the Anglo-Norman administration. There are also records in the same period of entire shipfuls of grain being used to satisfy ransom of captured knights or their family members in Ulster. From transcribed paper records called pipe rolls held for centuries in Dublin, we know that a branch of the important Norman dynastic de Mandeville family originating first in Normandy, France, then Somerset, England, became seneschals of Ulster for generations having arrived in the late 12th century. A Robert de Mandeville was at Carrickfergus with King John in 1210 and appears as a tenant-in-chief in Ulster in 1221 AD. In the late 1200s and early 1300s, de Mandevilles owned cultivated farmland at Ballyholme's adjacent settlement of Groomsport Village, as well as Ballyphilip townland, Comber and Bally Robert townland. A John de Mandeville was a sheriff of Down and Ards in 1333. If you look at the spelling of Grimsport in Thomas Raven's 1625 map, you can see it is written as Gromsport. A Grom in Anglo-Norman is a retainer or knight squire. In the Montgomery manuscripts 1603 to 1706, William Montgomery referring to the Ards mentions a master of escury meaning a squire's place or the estate of a squire. So it would seem squires were given their parcels of land too. Did the former Norman owners of Grimsport, a de Mandeville or their predecessor, name the settlement? With so many Norman names along this shoreline, like the Copeland Islands, it's very possible. What confuses the issue later is the fact that just as the Normans adopted Irish place names, the Irish later adopted or adapted the Norman place names long after their subsequent demise. To quote the National Archives, 
Manors varied in size from a few acres within a single parish to manors covering several whole parishes and even parcels of land scattered across several parishes but not adjacent to one another. They were, however, administered by their lords as a single unit. A landlord, for example a knight awarded lands after campaigning in Ulster, was the usual owner of the mill on his estate. All his tenants had to grind their corn there and maintain the mill under feudal obligation. These feudal estate mills were oft referred to as manor mills, an official relationship not diminished until the advent of a government incentivised flour milling programme in Ulster from the 1760s, which saw a rapid growth in provincial mill capacity. A medieval mill was an important device in the control of land and tenants, protecting the business and security interests of its owner. At this time in North Down, the working Irish land tenants of these Norman manor owners used crops and services as currency in lieu of rent. Coinage was not a typical transaction for the feudal tenant farmer. To quote Charles Doherty in Exchange and Trade in Early Medieval Ireland, in the 12th century, reciprocity was still the main mechanism by which society was held together in Ireland. Later 16th and 17th century records show that reciprocity continued with, for example, what we now imply as modern Irish whiskey was also a tenant currency, aggregated and sold on by Irish lords from their estates by the hogshead or barrel. This exchange mechanism also protected the long-term integrity of these estates. More than likely, Ballyhome with its small but lively river offered medieval mill founders an opportunity that much of the Ards Peninsula to the southeast did not. Due to a relatively flat topography, providing little in the way of strong, consistent inland watercourses. The Anglo-Norman estates at Donacadee and Mill Isle were similar advantageous sites. Eventually, windmills would create a solution to that problem, and they proliferated on hilltops along the windy east coast of Ulster in the 1700s. Here is that original 1780 windmill at Ballyhome, set in rolling countryside and pitched on high ground overlooking the water mill to the east in the valley below. Over a hundred windmills are recorded on the original Ordnance Survey maps of County Down, 1834. The vast majority stone tar mills producing oatmeal and flowers. In episode 2 of The Miller's Tale, we'll focus on Anglo-Norman place names, the history of milling in this locale, the defence of mills, quarrying for millstones and the story of a bridge.